Hello. Hi, Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another great session on Mindful Publishing Facebook and YouTube Live uh, interview. Today, I have a very great uh, guest in person of Steve Lestaka. I call him the short story guru. We were supposed to have featured her earlier, but due to some hitches, he couldn't make it now his life. Stephen Carr is one of those prolific writers that I respect a lot. Today, we have the chance to ask him a number of questions. Please welcome Stephen Lester Carr. Thank you very much, Adentu. It's nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. In a few words, who is Stephen Lester Carr? What was your passion for creative writing? See, in a few words, let's see. I'm the, um, I'm the final result of a life full of experiences. That's me right now. And my, and the second question was about creative writing. What got me into creative writing or? What was your passion for creative writing? Oh, well, let's see, that's changed over the years. Um, when I first started out at writing, I didn't really have the passion for it. I was encouraged to do it, and I went into the military as a military journalist. And of course, that has its own passion attached to it. But over the years, after playwriting, it took me a long time to really gain that passion for doing it. And I didn't really get that fire in my belly until about 2016. And I was mentoring a college student who wanted to know about fiction writing. And I thought, well, let's see, I'm not one who rests on his laurels. And I need to show him how to do it, how you get published, how to write, how to get published before I could actually teach him how to do it. So I wrote a story and it was accepted right away. And that sort of lit the fire. That's great. OK. Would you say your foray into the literary domain was an accident of history or a deliberate choice to leave enduring legacies for posterity? Um, it's an accident. Um, I really, I mean, I always thought that at some point I would be some kind of writer, but I never intended to be, as I said, a short story writer. I thought I'd be a playwright, and I thought that was going to be my ticket to fame if I was going to be known for anything. But um, that that kind of fell by the wayside. And after I closed my uh, theatrical production company in the state of Arizona, I took a couple years and then began writing the short stories. But all that's kind of very accidental. As I said, I uh, really only began writing short stories in earnest to show a student who I was mentoring how to do it. None of this has really been planned out. Everything has kind of fallen into place following that. You are such a restless creative spirit, one of the most prolific writers I've ever seen. How do you find a balance in churning out stories daily and still make the difference? Um, I don't overthink what I do. I write from my past experience. I mean, every story, even the most imaginative, has some sort of a connection to or glimpses into who I am as a person. Um, of course, that varies a great deal. I mean, literary stories have a lot more, and of course, fantasy and science fiction have a lot less. But um, in terms of being, um, <laughs> I don't know, a great writer, that's kind of very subjective. And I think it's a real danger to become too enamored when, with one's own writing. So I approach my writing from the point of view of what is the story I'm going to tell? Am I going to be able to tell it um, in a way that sounds like it's coming from me? Is it my style? Is it my voice? And is it a story that people are going to be interested in here reading? Um, I was told recently, and it never had struck me before, that I'm a commercial writer. By commercial, the person who told me that, who was an editor, meant that I write stories that are written for the everyday population. Um, they're not written for people who have who are high-minded literary-wise. Uh, it's the person who wants to sit down and read a story, and that's what I write for. 
and that in itself is not a, uh, I mean, I'm, it's neither a statement of being a, below or above the normal writer. It is just who I am. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, literary creativity is fraught with limitations and possibilities. What is your guiding principle? What, your success rate so far has been awesome. What guys, uh, what's, the, what's your guiding principle? Well, early on, I learned what to match what I what a publisher wants to what I can write, not to go around the uh, go the other way around. Um, I think a lot of writers struggle with they write a story and then they spend a lot of time trying to find somebody to match it to. Um, from my perspective, it's much easier to know what a publication or a publisher is looking for, and then to write the story. Um, use what the right what the publisher is the prompt write from that. Um, and I've done that almost from the very beginning. Um, and that took off very quickly. Um, as I said, I, my first story was published and, and that followed right behind, every story followed very quickly behind that only because I looked at what the publisher was looking for and the wrote a story based on what it was they were looking for, not what was in my head. Uh, do you have role models in your writing career? Or is it entirely a journey of self-exploration for you? Um, well, in college, of course, um, and in high school, I had writers who I uh, greatly admired. Um, but I would say that my writing is really mine. Um, I don't really follow anybody, and I don't I don't emulate anyone. Um, obviously, there's comparisons. I've been compared to a lot of different writers, but my writing is my own. Um, I, I try to not let other writers, even now when I read lots of current day and modern short story writers, I, not, I try not to let any of their writing influence how I write. Um, I think a person's voice comes from within them um, and it finds its way onto the page. And I certainly think that's true of how I write. Which book or books remain reference points to you as a person? Uh, do you have any particular author that you, you really would say that's the role model? Um, <laughs> uh, no, um, to answer that, um, let's see. Early on, my, my first real big influences were Joseph Conrad, um, and that was in high school and then college. Oh, actually, even before college, when I was in the military as a journalist, I latched on to W. Somerset Mom whose stories for some reason really appealed to me. And I spent like an entire summer reading nothing but W. Somerset mom stories. Um, and so they were great influences, but I kind of put them way, way behind me because I'm not them and, and I'm a writer of my own. I mean, I have my own stories to tell. Their stories are theirs, my stories are mine. Their voices are theirs, my voice is mine. And I try to keep that very separate. Um, and over the years, I've read lots of different writers. I mean, you can't you can't be a good writer without being a good reader. So I've read lots and lots of different authors, but I I can't really think of a single author who I would compare myself to on a continuous basis. As I said, other writers and readers tend to say, "Oh, well, he sounds he reads a little bit like so and so or so and so," but that's them. That's them projecting their feelings or their ideas about my writing but it's not how I approach my writing. I don't approach my writing from thinking, oh, let's see, I'm going to write like this person or I or I think I write like this person, because I think that'd be a big mistake. That's good. Now, you published over 430 short stories in journals, magazines, international journals, magazines, and um, what have you. How did you, how, how did you achieve that kind of feat within a space of two years? Well, it's actually been since 2016, so it's four years, um, and um, it, it equals out to about 100 years a store, uh, 100 stories a year, which is actually quite a bit. Still, um, I mean, I, I say that without trying to sound like a braggart, but it's still like uh, over 100 year, 100 stories a year. Um, again, it goes back to I, I, I'm a, because of my trainings as a journalist. I was taught, uh, trained how to write fast and think quick in terms of my writing, and that applies to how I write short stories. So I turn out a short story every few days, 
um, based on being able to write fast and knowing exactly what it is that I'm going to write. Um, and again, because I know what it is I'm writing, I don't just write a story and then try to find a publisher and I know exactly who it is I'm writing for. I'm able to target in exactly what it is, my story exactly to the publication and get that to them very quickly. And generally, not always, but generally the responses come back in speedy enough time that while I'm waiting, I can also write other stories and submit other stories. So it's a kind of continuous process. Um, I look at it from a business point of view. I'm producing a product. And in order to be a good, successful businessman, you've got to produce frequently. And that's how I approach my writing. Um, and so I do it on and on. And I don't, I'm not, I'm relentless. I don't sit back and go, okay, now what am I going to write? Oh, what am I going to write? Well, I know what I'm going to write. And I just write. I sit down and I do the job. Your success rate has been phenomenal. What's the secret? Oh, you know what? I've I've never really measured that, but I think it's somewhere in terms of submissions, and we're talking primarily about magazines and anthologies and print publications, online publications, not books, that sort of thing. Um, I think my rate is around 50% submissions. That means 50% of are accepted submissions. I think. I'm not quite sure, but I think it's around 50%. Okay, you have a, a couple of short stories. Uh, you've published a couple of short stories, uh, collections of short stories. Yeah. I remember The Heat, Stand, uh, uh, The Tales of Thakanok, and um, a couple of other stories. Can you, well, let's start with Heat. How did it come, come about? Well, let's see. Heat is actually the second collection of short stories, and that fell behind uh, Sand is the first collection you asked me to bring along, so I have them all stacked here. Sand is the first one that was published by Clarendon House Publications. And then, can you, Heat, can you, can you let's, let's get to feeling? Can we hold that up a little longer? Yes, you can. Okay. Okay. How many short stories are in, in Sand? Um, yes, okay, hold on. I think there are about 30 in sand. There are about 30 stories in sand. And these first few short, short story books or collections, they're actually collections. Um, and by collections, that means that these are stories that are already public, previously published in other publications. And I just brought the best of those together and put them in a collection. So sand was the first one. And that was done by Clarendon House Publications. And the reason that that one was done was that Grant Hudson, who is the publisher at Clarendon House, knew of my short story success because I'm a member of the Inner Circle Writers Group, which is a Facebook group. And he had been following my success over my first 100 stories. And at that point asked if I'd be interested in putting together a collection. I said, oh yeah, well, yeah, right, exactly. Um, and so that was put together the first one. Then Heat, um, was put together by CZKY Pay Mate Productions, um, which is a, another publisher had seen my writing um, on another uh, on one of the websites or on a web page or somewhere, and asked me if I'd be interested in doing a collection for them, which I did, and that also has about thirty stories in it. What about um, um, do you have the the, the heat with you? Yes, I do. Oh, I'm sorry. And this is he. How many short stories do we have in there? That's about 30 also. And as you can see, there's kind of a theme. There's a similar theme in the cover of these stories. And I'll show you Rainy in a second. It's like sand. It's very simple with a simple title on the front title and a very simple graphic on the front. Same is true of heat. And you'll see that again when, you, when I show you the next one. But the first three are very simple in terms of their uh, the cover graphics. And there's a reason for that, but do you want me to go on to the next one? No, let, let's get to hear the reason. Why, why, why the simple graphics? Nothing well, so is, is esoteric. Well, my first, my intention was to keep things as simple as possible, that this is about the stories. This isn't about the pictures on the book. It isn't about me as a person or as a writer. It's about the stories. And what I wanted 
the right the reader to do was pick it up, pick up the book, and go. Well, see, I don't really care what the cover says. I don't really care about the writer's autobiography or their biography. What I want to know is, can this guy write? And that was my intention. It was like, okay, I need to introduce readers to who I am. How do I do that? Well, I say simply, these are my stories. These are my stories in sand. These are my stories in heat. And if you like these, you'll read the next ones. And that led to the next public. That led to the next collection. Okay, let's talk about the tales of Tokanok. Oh, we're going to jump right to that one. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, let me go to. The, let me jump over you a little bit, if you don't mind, Identu. Um, this is the third one, and and just I'll show you very quickly. That also has about thirty stories in it, and again, the gra the graphic on it is very. Okay, quick. I forgot that one. <laughs> That's quite all right. All right. Thank you. And I don't want to jump under your time, so just tell me to shut up when I need to shut up. No, okay. No, go ahead. It's, yeah, you, it's your stage. <laughs> You're my special oh, no. guest. All right. Okay. Well, let's see. The Tales of Talk or Knock. Let me get that, dig that out. Oh, I forgot Tales of Talk or Knock. Anyway, the Tales of Talk or Knock is a young adult collection, and it's all fantasy based on one character named Talk or Knock, and um, and it it's along the lines in a com combination of characters of everyone from Tarzan to um, to Indiana Jones and, and a number of, of characters in between. Um, but, he, but he travels through time and travels through uh, different uh, stories and different, and different places and different times in history. Um, and, and again, it's a young adult, it's a young adult collection, primarily for the teenage years. Um, and and that was the that was the first story after my collections, and that was also published by Clarendon House Publications. Okay, tell us about uh, Rain. How many stories short stories are in Rain? Uh, Rain has thirty short stories. Um, again, all the collections have about thirty. What I did was I went back through the publications and I said, okay, what are my best best short stories out of those that have been published like within the previous year? And in rain, I think by that point I had had, oh, let me check. But I think I had like 260, maybe a little more stories published by that point. And so I had a fairly good number of stories over the previous year to collect, to select stories from, and those are what's incl included in rain. You found out the Sweet uh, Card Press, and which has helped to showcase the number of emerging talent. I remember I, I, was, I also made it to the Who's Who of Emerging Writers 2020. What's the, uh, the, the idea behind the Swedish Art Press? Well, let's see. Um, jump, we're kind of jumping over things just a little bit, but that actually is a lead in. What happened was that um, I found that with writing with for uh, publishers, was that while I liked working with Grant Hudson, my feeling was that I didn't have enough creative control over my own work. Um, I liked how he put stuff together, but he was basically collecting all the money. Um, and I thought, well, okay, well, I'm glad he's making money, but I need to make some money on my own. Um, and I thought, well, I'm going to self-publish. So I first self-published my, um, oh, I did find Tales of Talk or Knock, by the way. Let me hold that up for a second. I did find Tales of Talk or Knock. This is Tales of Talk or Knock. Going back, sorry about that, Edentu. That's Tales of Talk or Knock. Okay. Um, it's a pretty big book. Okay, so let me go ahead, let me jump over, just go jump back just a little bit. So the next book that was done was The uh, Very Best of Steve Carr by, um, and, and that, that includes 50 short stories, and that was also done by Clarendon House. It's the only hard book of my, of my books that were done, and it's actually a collection of 50 of my overall time favorites, and that's based on and that also includes um, commentary by over 80 writers, authors, um, readers, artists, poets, um, and friends worldwide who made comments on the stories that are included in the book. Um, so let's see, go, jumping back to your question. So after all that, I thought, let's see, how do I do this myself? How do I self-publish and feel okay about, about receiving my own royalties on my own books? So I went through that process and, and then published my own book. Redbird, that's my first and only novel so far. And then LGBTQ, which is a collection of 33 stories. And then 
I did a follow up to that with um, theory of the theory of existence. By that point, I began to realize, and, and actually was well I was aware of it ahead of time ahead of that, that writers really emerging writers have a really hard time in marketing their books. Publishers don't really market your books, not to a great extent, other than that they may add your name to their to their portfolio or, or to what they publish, but they don't really do the marketing of your books for you. You're still left up to do that a lot on your own. And I saw that on a lot of the Facebook groups specifically, that there, there was space given to writers. Are you there? Yeah, I'm listening. Yeah, I'm listening. Okay. Um, that um, the space was given for writers to display their, their works, but there was really no assistance in how to market their books. And I thought, well, there's something fundamentally wrong with that. It's like, well, it's going back to saying, okay, we're going to put all the onus of responsibility on how to market your books entirely on you. Well, writers already knew that the, that onus was on them. But it's like, well, how do we do that? How do we do that without getting any support? And I said to myself, okay, well, let's see. I need to be the person that helps. I know how to work through publishers. I know how to self-publish. I know how it's done. How do I help other writers to do that? And so I founded Sweetie Cat Press which is a Facebook group, which its sole mission is to help emerging writers become established. And by the way we do that is that we promote the writers, uh, both through publishing their works um, or publishing their, their brand and their name and their profiles in books like The Book of Books, which is one of the more recent publications by Sweet Cat Press, which includes covers of the, of the books the writers wrote along with the uh, blurbs to the books. And there's about a hundred and so books in this book. And then also Sweet Cat Press has published The Who's Who of Emerging Writers, which lists 106, 116 writers that are all emerging who have had published works published. And this book was put together after the bios were submitted by the writers were um, then looked at by about half a dozen different editors and publishers who said, yes, this is an emerging writer with a valid, um, substantial background, and they were included in that book. And so we, so Sweetie Cat Press put this together and then published this. We now have two other books that are currently under, under, uh, under in the works. One is I the, I, the, I the Writer, which will be coming out in November, which includes about 110 essays from writers who are emerging writers, who are also Facebook group members. And those are essays about who they are as writers, how they became writers. And then the next one that's coming out in, in January is a, um, an anthology of stories that the main character has to be a writer. And there are 20 stories in that. And those are all writers who are also members of Sweetie Cat Press. Yeah, Steve, I, I really want to appreciate your large heart because I, my, I, I think in, I appeared in two of those books, The Wishful of Emerging Writers and The Book of Books. Uh, can, can, I, I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart because it was your acceptance that made it possible for me to appear on The Wishful of Emerging Writers 2020. Uh, my bio that is, and also the book of books, two of my books, Titan Race and uh, Richard and Pride also featured there. Please, kindly, for the sake of this interview, kindly pick one of the books at a time and turn the page to where I feature. Let me see the beauty of it all. Um, you want me to go back to the beginning? <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. All right, okay. The, uh, maybe you start with the issue of emerging writers. And then you go back to. Oh, you want me to go backwards? Okay. All right. All right. This is the who's who of emerging writers. Yes, I, I my bio is in it. Can you uh, help uh, help me see where the, the bio is, please? Um, what you can see is the bios. Do you want to see your specific bio? My bio. Okay, hold on.
Oh, that's 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 my bio. There's your your bio. Yes, we're very proud to have you among us. By the way, Dentu, you're a terrific writer, um, and all the editors and uh, uh, publishers who were involved with the selection were really impressed with your background. So, and I don't know if, and it's not connected to why you're in these books, but uh, you you are one of the six moderators for Sweetie Cat Press, and I am so honored that you're one of that group. Uh, Sweetie, Pat, Sweetie, Cat Press, Sweetie Cat Press Group uh, operates without any malfunction whatsoever in its past year, primarily because you are one of its members. So I'm deeply indebted to you for that, as are all emerging writers. So thank you for your contributions also. Thank you. That, the, the debt is mutual. I'm also indebted to you for your support all the way. Thank you so much. Thanks to the Sweetie Card Press. And whatever I can do to to showcase Sweetie Card Press and your brand, count me in. Oh, well, thank you. Well, I like OK, well. To the next okay, question. Right. Did you want me to this continue is, on? With, go ahead. Yes, the book of books. All right. This is the book of books. That's the book of books. And as I, as you can see, is that it shows the cover of the book. Unfortunately, in black and white. That's, that's, that's the cover of my collection of uh, poems, Richard on Pride. Oh, lovely book. There you are. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, right. viewers, you've seen it. These books are on the internet. You can just click on, Google it on Amazon and then buy your copy. They are excellent books, great writers around the world, emerging writers around the world who have made impact one way or the other. And the selection process for the who is who of emerging writers was very rigorous. You have to have been traditionally published and uh, Claridon House owned by Grant Houston and uh, Steve Lester Carr, Sudikar Press. They had to look at what you have actually published to, for you to qualify to be in that book. And also the book of book is basically about writers who have made impact, their covers, uh, book covers and the blog was in that too. Lovely book for anyone to have, go and get yours. And then Steve Carr has a number of collection, uh, collection of short stories that you've seen. Heat, rain, um, sand, uh, sand, sand, and we didn't get to some of the others or we didn't At go. At least help me out go ahead. Ahead. The, the tales of talking about rain, and, uh, okay, so the books are out there. Just Google Steve Carr, all these books will come up. Now, the question that I want to ask for those who are watching us live and around the world what's the best way to fine tune one's craft as a writer? Tell us the um, secrets that work well, for you. See, I think it depends on whether you're writing a short story or whether you're or if you're writing a novel because the approaches are different. I mean, you basically have to have the same things in both, but um but the approaches are different. To be a successful short story writer, you have to know what, what are the elements of a short story. Every short story, no matter what it is, has to have at least one or more of these, of these elements and usually two or three of them. So first know what the basic elements are. And the basic elements are, and this is, this is going to be kind of um, first grade material for those of you who are already well versed in writing short stories. You have to have a character, you have to have plot, you have to have conflict, you have to have a theme, and you have to have a, an ending. All short stories from the beginning of time, from the point of point when man first started telling short stories to each other or making drawings on the wall, everything had the same had the same line. It's like it began with who's the character and where does it end? And it has that structure. And it, without that structure, a short story is not a story. You can throw a whole bunch of words on a page but unless it has a short story structure, it's not a short story. Even if you want to call it a story, it's not a short story unless it has that structure. Um, and that's that's universal. And to get published universally, you have to follow the short story structure. You have to have the elements of a short story, and you have to you have to have what the right what the editor or publisher wants, and that's good writing. So the second thing is you have to know what a short story is, and the second thing is you have to be able to write. And to do that, you have to know, and it, and and this kind of goes by nation by nation. I mean, each country has its its own version of of what their writing style is all about. I mean, I have good friends in Nigeria who are writers. As a matter of fact, while I'm at it, I want to plug one. Um, his book is the Black Empire, um, the Black the Black Python Empire. 
and it's written by Ichiku Obayora. I'm going to mispronounce his last name correctly, incorrectly, but it's a great book. But it points to the difference in terms of how s stories are structured and how writing is structured differently country to country. But almost universally, American English is kind of the standard followed by British English. Um, and you have to know at least one or both of those in order to get published globally. And that means published globally and then read globally. And the only way you can do that is by following um, what's good grammar and good spelling for both of those. So you have to learn those. You have to go to either, you have to learn it in high school or read a lot or even more preferred is go to a college and university or university or a small college and learn how to write. Um, I can't under, I can't overemphasize the importance of just learning how to write. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes a lot of sense. There are two normative standards of the English, the British English and the American English, like you just rightly pointed out. And there are also regional varieties of uh, the English language. So anybody who wants to write well has to know this, uh, the normative standards, the British English and American English. And there may be regional standards, like you said, every country has its own way of telling stories and all that. Now, let me uh, right. get to the next question. The writing process can be uh, very tedious and exhilarating at the same time. How do you overcome these emotions? What works for you? Is it planning ahead or just giving, going with the flow as the ideas pop, pop up? Well, the way I work it out is that I know ahead of time what I'm going to write. I know how I'm going to start the story and how I'm going to end it. Um, and generally, I start with a title. Um, I mean, I, I look at what a publisher wants or what a publication wants to write. I'll say to myself, okay, I can write a story about that. Um, okay, what's the title? I'll think up a title, I'll write the title down, and then I'll go, okay, let's see, what's the first paragraph or what's the beginning going to be like? What's the ending going to be like? I have those firmly planted in my head, and that's where I start. Again, I'll go back to say that, and I kind of over, because of lots of things, we sort of skipped over. I spent years between being a journalist and writing short stories as a playwright and had several successful plays produced on stage. That also laid a ground for groundwork for writing short stories. Um, a short story, you start with a scene um, and then you go into the whole meat of what the story is and then you have a resolution or ending. For, for plays, it's the same thing. You start with what the, what is the set on the stage, what is the story in between, and then the curtain closes. In terms of writing short stories, that's how I think. What is the opening scene? What is the all the rest of the stuff that's going to happen in between the opening scene and the close and the curtain closing? And then I'll sit down and write from the top of my head and fill in all the details in between. I'll know who the characters are from my opening and where they're headed, but I'll write how that all progresses as I go along. So I really don't have that stress or angst about a story because I kind of have an idea of where I'm going with it. And I almost I, I can't think of very it's very few times I've ever stopped and said this isn't working and thrown it away. I've always gone with, okay, this is the story I'm going to write, and that's how I write. And I I think only about ten of my stories have never been published. So I so I'm kind of a very confident writer, and maybe that's part of it. You have to have some confidence in what you're writing. Okay, you did mention in the course of the interview that you you, you are a journalist by training. Uh, can you tell right. us a little bit about that aspect of your life? Um, well, let's see, I had just gotten out of high school. Um, I knew I was going to go into the Army. I had joined while I was in the Ar while I was in high school, but I was only 17, but couldn't go in until I was 18. Um, so I joined the Army knowing that I was going to be a journalist, and that was only because I scored really high on the um, aptitude test for and the language skills, both in writing and speaking. And fortunately, I was able to get into the very prestigious military uh, school, the Defense Information School, which trains military journalists in the U.S. Um, and so I completed that and then spent the next few years writing newspaper articles in the state of Florida and Georgia on military matters. Um, but I, my long-term goal was never to be a journalist. Um, it just didn't really appeal to me, and I was find it less appealing after I did it for a couple of years. Like, oh, oh man, I, this is this I would never do. So anyway, that that, but it started me out in terms of this is how you write. This is how you write a sentence. 
This is how you write a paragraph. This is how you make it interesting. This is how you um, do your follow through. Um, it taught me a lot. Okay, uh, give us a little bit of background about being uh, a top-notch military journalist. What does it entail? Um, well, you, well, first you have to you have to graduate the school, which isn't that easy to do, um, and th because they don't accept that many, they don't. It still exists to this day, and that was back in 1972 that I was in it. Um, it still exists to this day, although it's now located in in a different state than where I was went through, but. Um, what it teaches you is, first off, how to follow the five W's, who, what, where, when, why, and how, which, by the way, applies to short stories. You want to ask the same questions, who, what, where, when, why, and how. Um, and all, once you answer all those questions in your short story, then you've probably done a pretty good job. But in journalism, that's it. You learn those fundamentals, and then you write every story, that you, almost every story you write based on those five fundamentals. And I'll repeat those again who, what, where, when, why, and how, and commit those those five to your memory, because you can use them over and over again in every terms of every every type of writing that you write, except for maybe poetry. Um, anyway, so, so the Defense Information School requires, and you have to be able to graduate with a good, I mean, good grades, and then once you're out, they assign you to where you go, and then you begin to write for you write publications all over, as I said. Um, I don't know that there's much more to that other than that you have to you have to be good at it. That's great. Now tell me, uh, what's your favorite story? Is it a short story or uh, it's something you've written that you consider this is my favorite? Oh my! <laughs> let's see. Well, let's remember I've got over 440 story, short stories written, and so selecting one that's my favorite is a dangerous. Uh, that's a minefield for me to walk across. But um, let's see, I do have my personal favorites, probably going way back to the beginning. I wrote a short story called Tenderloin, which is about a army vet who now lives in a rundown motel or a hotel in the middle of a of the of the uh, a hard, very hard town of part of, of the city called the Tenderloin. Um, it's a very rough part of town. Um, and he's he's home. He's basically homeless, other than living in that that hotel, which as I said is run run down. He has to figure out how to make a living. Um, he's on the street. He gets lot lots of sexual propositions for making money that way, but he has no interest in doing that. Um, he finally lands a job by um, or is offered a job by the grocery store that he goes in to get his daily lunch. Um, he's offered a job there, but the evening before he's supposed to start the job, the uh, owner of the store is killed by a uh, by a burglar, and so he loses that job. And the next day, he realizes he's back to the back to square one. To basically, he's going to lose his he's going to lose his money, his source of income. He's going to end up on the streets. He's maybe going to have to do things that are unsavory that he doesn't want to do. And he's offered an opportunity, earns money, but it's in a really uh, uh, disturbing way. And, uh, and the whole story ends almost on a very tragic note where he ends up almost killing somebody and acting out the other person's um, demented um, fantasy. Um, it's not sexual, but it, it borders on that, but it's a very demented fantasy. Um, and that story kind of resonates with me even still because it, it speaks back to what I know about the uh, sad situation that many homeless veterans live through. Um, I I knew that section of the city. It's basically based on San Tenderloin area of San Francisco. I lived in San Francisco for a few years, so I'm very familiar with that area of the city. Um, and this gets back to where your personal life kind of ties into to what you write as fiction. So that story stands out for me a lot of ways and still resonates. And it's still republished. Um, a lot of my stories are reprinted because they stand this test of time. Tenderloin has been reprinted probably about four or five times since its initial printing. So I'm very proud of it. Um, and again, like I said, it, it, it kind of stands out for me. But, but there's a lot of stories of mine that do that for me. Again, I'm trying not to brag, but um, anyway, you're kind of making me do that. Uh, I didn't do. But again, I warn, I warn anybody, do not become too enamored with your own work. Once you do that, you're in big trouble. 
Oh, that's uh, very interesting stories. I, I wish I had read something like that. I've read several of your short stories. You won't know that I'm one of your fans and I have a collection of them. I read a lot of your st short stories. I learn a lot from them too. Now tell us your debut novel, Redbird. Oh. I had the privilege of reading the first three chapters. Uh -huh. so, what is it about? It's a paranormal uh, uh, horror kind of thing, right? Yes. Yeah, Redbird, let's see, let me pull that out for you. Um, okay, that's Redbird. Did you see that? Were you able to see that okay, Dentu? No, I, can you please read the other bit? Yeah, that's Redbird. Okay, all right. All right, that's, that's Redbird. I actually started writing that about 10 years ago um, and I finished it and I hated the process of writing a novel. I just absolutely hated it. I hated it from the moment of trying to figure out what I was going to write because it was a whole new way of thinking for me um, to the point of, of getting it published. I did self-publish it. I, I marketed it around to publishers and I got a couple offers and I, I didn't like the offers at all. And I thought, well, I'm just going to publish this myself. And I did that. Um, it is a story about a young boy. He's about 11 or 12 years old. He's in, he's in middle school and he, his family, because of dire, their dire situation, they moved to a neighborhood um, that's very run down. Um, and they go to a school, he, he's, in, he's enrolled in a school that's right across the street from where he lives. Um, and, autumn, and immediately he realizes there's something wrong with the school and the school is haunted. Um, and the whole book is about his experience of, of attending this haunted school while living at home with a very dysfunctional, uh, in a very dysfunctional situation with uh, parents who are both abusive and neglectful. Um, and so the whole story follows follows what happens to him throughout that entire time. Okay, what would you like to be rem remembered for as a writer? Oh, um, well, <laughs> uh, actually, I'd like to be remembered as a good person first, um, even before being right, remembered as a writer. I'd like to remember that I did some things to help other writers. That's actually more important to me than being a good writer myself. But if I'm going to be remembered as a writer, is like I'd like to remember that I wrote a few, a few stories that are meaningful, that are that stand the test of time, that are representative of these times in which we live, um, that reflect my voice. Um, maybe that's it. What would be your last, uh, your casting words for writers out there? Those who admire you, those who want, uh, will look up to you. What would be your advice? Oh, um, hmm. Well, after you've learned writing, I mean, that is, you know how to write grammar, you know how to, your spelling, you know what the structure of a story is. Once you get those down, um, follow your voice. Don't listen to what other people tell you what you should write or tell you how to write. Write what you think you should write. Write how you should write and become comfortable with that first. Um, in terms of writing, as I said, I write what publications want, but I don't do that by giving up my voice. I write my voice. I write what I think should be written. Um, and that's why I think I'm somewhat successful because I don't follow by what other people tell me to write. I write exactly what it is that I want to write. Um, it's okay to be graded in, in school and college on your papers and be told that this is what you should do or shouldn't do, but put that behind you once you're no longer being graded. Think for yourself, write for yourself, listen to yourself, be confident in who you are as a writer, and that'll help your own confidence as a person, but listen to your own voice. Um, and lots of people use um, beta readers and other people to, to read over the works, which is fine. That's not what I do. I've never allowed anybody to read anything that I've written before it's published. But if that's what you do, that's fine. But don't give up your voice. Don't give up your work to your beta reader. Remember that it's you who's writing the story. It's you who, whose words and voice are heard in the story. So don't give any of that up. Stay true to who you are as a writer and write that. 
Wow, what, 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 what an excellent advice. You heard it Thank all you. from Steve Carr. He said, follow your voice, write what you want to write, retain your distinctive voice. No matter what you do, don't let people sway you here and there, just be you. That is advice from the writing, I call him the writing gurus, the short story guru, Steve Carr. Uh, it's been a wonderful uh, 45 minutes with one of the, uh, the best writers around the world that we've ever seen, Steve Carr. Thank you for being my special guest in this show. I really appreciate you. Thank you, Dentu. Thank you for having me, and, and thank you to everybody who's watching and listening. Now, before we draw the curtains, I, I'm also a writer. I have a couple of books out there, and let's take a look at one of them. You go and get your copy. Titan Rays. The abrupt realignment of forces by the guardians of the black hole 25,000 years ago and the civilization of Atlantis in the deluge. Natudio, the then Earth guardian, reincarnates with the mandate to stir the modern world away from the fate of Atlantis. Natu realizes, however, that two things do not occupy the same space as his heart knows for beautiful iron and Lena, two avengers from his past whilst trying to arc the Guardian script, an intricate web of love and hate ensues as Nedu's instinct of survival come alive, setting the stage for a brilliant drama of wit, gut, and sorcery. That's Titan Race. Book one of the Manu series by yours truly, Edento Rosso. It has been a wonderful time chatting with my friend and brother, Steve Carr. Thank you for watching. Good night from here.